Hey, good morning, everyone. Hey, you know, this is just one of those good feel days where we all feel good. You guys feel good this morning? Yeah, you look good. You look great. Hey, let me just start off by saying to all of those in Maui at our Maui campus, welcome this morning. They're joining us right now. Again, give them a big, big hand. Love all of you guys that are there. And then also for all of you that are here at our campus, Copper Point campus, man, glad you are here. Something about coming to the house of God, coming to church uh, every Sunday. Sunday just starts your day and starts your whole week uh, right because you're able to take the Word of God and apply it to your life and so many great things are taking place. Well, this morning uh, we are starting a brand new series that we are very, very excited about, Citizens of Heaven. And what this is, it's the next step of our vision. And guys, I want you to really tune in with me for a moment because in the next four weeks, uh, we're going to be talking about who we are as a church, where we're going, what our future looks like, and we're asking every single person to make every, every effort possible to be able to be here in all of these weeks that you understand who we are uh, as a church, that's all of us, and then the part that you play in making this great. And so um, uh, we just have a lot of, you know, very, very exciting things uh, in store for you. I'm going to take just a couple of minutes before Dustin comes this morning, and I want to give you a little bit of the background that we've been talking about. And uh, one of the things in this series that we're talking about is the transition that we are in the middle of, that we announced last January as a pastoral transition. And so I want to just address that for a moment. Pastor Dustin and Mandy, in January, will become the lead pastors of our church here, Copper Point, and we're really, really excited about that. And uh, we have that date nailed down, the day that that transition will take place is January the 26th. Write that down, an easy way to remember it. It's going to be the last Sunday of January. We want to pack out this place, and we just want it to be a great celebration. And we're, uh, you know, again, very, very excited about what God is doing and where God is leading all of us. It was about two and a half years ago. In fact, in January, it'll be three years, that Dustin and I sat down and started talking about what would it look like in a transition of where you would step in and become the lead pastor. And so this has been a long process. We have moved very, very slowly. Uh, we've been very methodical in, in all of the process. Uh, in starting it, we were kind of lost in how to even get this thing going because it was much bigger than what we realized. And we brought in an outside consultant to help us. We talked a lot with our church board. Uh, it was last January that our board, uh, they voted in uh, Pastor Dustin and Mandy as our lead pastors, pastor-elect, which will become official this coming January. And so um, then about a year and a half ago, uh, Dustin and I were sitting in my office, and this was a very serious conversation of where I told him, Dustin, I really believe that at this time that uh, you need to start praying and asking God to give you the vision of where God is going to lead you and where, you know, spiritually speaking, the mantle of vision would remove off of me and that it would move on to you and that, uh, that you would begin to pray and seek God and really, you know, try to figure out where is it that God is leading Copper Point, leading all of us, and you would lead the way as the church visionary. And so he did that, and... Um, you know, and, and I think one of the things that the reason why that this series is so important is that he's going to be unfolding a lot of that to you and where you firsthand, where you're not hearing it from someone else, firsthand that you're here, you're hearing it, and you know exactly what is happening. This is what I want every one of you to understand as we start this, is that Dustin and Mandy are not coming in uh, to upset the apple cart, change the vision of Copper Point, the vision really is not changing. And here is the beauty of all of this, is that for the last 14 years, Dustin and I have been able to work side by side on this staff, and together we have developed the vision in which you are living in right now here at Copper Point. That we've developed that, we've put it together, and, uh, and we developed the vision, and all of you sitting here are the ones who have made the vision take place. And so that's the beauty of that. But this is what happens so often in churches across the nation. I mean, extremely often. As the pastor grows older in age, the congregation grows older with him. 
And many times what happens is now with a lot of older people, they're no longer uh, relevant to a younger generation. They're not reaching the young. And so uh, what happens is a new younger pastor comes in, realizes they're not reaching the young, has to change the vision, everything in the church. When he changes everything, then the older crowd gets upset and they no longer like that and it causes church division many times a church split that is very common on january the 26th as we install pastor dustin and mandy as our lead pastors what you will notice is on that day it will be absolutely seamless there will not be a bump in the road we just keep moving on but this is what i love to say is that it's not a change in vision but it's an escalation of the vision that when they come in with their youth, energy, excitement, uh, passion, uh, that guys, they are going to elevate us to a whole nother level that we're all going to be excited about, that we get to play a part of really impacting our city and also people around the world. And so we get to get on this ship with them and that we're going to do amazing things uh, in the future. Now, uh, one of the things that I also want to just say, and then I'm going to turn it over to him, is that uh, over the last several months, I've had so many people coming up to Kay and I and saying, hey, what are you going to do uh, when you retire? You know, how is retirement going to be? Well, I, wanna, I want all of us, all right, to take that word retirement and throw it out the window, okay? Uh, I want to just say it this way, that in January, when this transition takes place, Kay and I will have been in full-time ministry for 40 years. And so, um, that really makes me sound old, doesn't it? I mean, that, that, that's 40 years, wow. Um, but uh, but whenever, you, whenever we think about that, what it is, is that we're not retiring. But what we want to do with still the energy and the passion that we have uh, for this place is that we just want to shift to another lane of ministry. That's what we're doing. And so uh, where Dustin has supported me for 14 years, I want to reverse that, and I want to support him with everything that I have and making you know, him successful and for all of us successful and, and where we all rally, but we're all excited about where this is taking us. And so, uh, Dustin, I'm going to ask you to come and join me real quick. And, um, And let's just talk briefly a little bit more about my role, and I'm going to let you jump in here and talk, you know, from uh, your point of view and how all this plays out. Yeah, so <clears throat> that was one of the biggest questions we were asked after we announced this in January was, uh, what is your role going to be? What's mom's role going to be? And we didn't expect that many questions coming that fast because we were up still in, in the middle of trying to figure that out. We're like, we don't know yet, you know? Um, so one of the ideas that we had was maybe just a, a quick reversal of positions where it would be lead pastor and then executive pastor for you, which, would, which was what I've been doing. And then we started practically playing that out in staff meetings. And, and it would, it's just weird. Like, my, you know, my dad comes in like two minutes late to a staff meeting. I'm like, uh, executive pastor, you're a little late. Um, you know, it just, it doesn't, it, it, it's, it's weird for everybody. It's weird for me because here's the truth, the bottom line. Um, when this transition takes place in January, he doesn't stop being my pastor. He is my pastor. He's my leader, um, my hero. And um, we, we were uh, studying the, the New Testament this last, uh, the beginning of this last summer. And what's really cool, when you see the apostles in the New Testament, when they develop young leaders, the apostles don't retire. Uh, they become that young leader's pastor. Every pastor has to have a pastor. And it was going to be that way anyways, and we just decided this summer with our board uh, to make it that way officially. And so one of the, some of the practical things are, um, my dad will have a permanent position on our board as my pastor and the apostolic oversight of our church and all future endeavors, where I will be the lead pastor, leading the way with vision and decision making, but he will be immediate um, accountability and pastoring and mentor for me. I call him about five times a day anyways. I'm sure when he sees my name on his phone, he's like, again? Yeah, you know, it, it's just how it is. We're best friends. We've always worked together. We've always hung out together. And, and we want to also show people that um, a father and son can really work together, even in a transition, um, and see both people flourish. Yeah, you know, and yeah, I love that. And, uh, you know, and, and again, you know, being in ministry for so long, I fully understand that you cannot have two heads. On that day of the 26th of January, they become the absolute lead pastors. And I mean, they are leading this way. 
and, uh, and we're all going to applaud that, follow that, and understand that we have amazing leaders in front of us. And uh, let me just end with this real quick because I don't want to take away any more time from him. But uh, the, in the last several years, I've had the opportunity of traveling across the nation uh, to different conferences, being with a lot of different pastors, and sitting in green rooms and talking. And what I have understood every time I come back to this place is how that all of these great leaders across the nation view uh, Pastor Dustin and Mandy as being some of the, uh, the upcoming best young leaders of our nation. Guys, uh, I think sometimes we kind of gloss over that and we realize, don't realize the type of leadership that we have coming in to lead us. These are exceptional leaders anointed by God. And guys, this is going to take us again to such high levels of ministry. And I'm thrilled and excited. And so I'm going to let him jump into this message without any more delay. And I want you to give our future pastor a big, big hand. Dustin, we love you guys. Awesome. Oh, man, that sounds funny still, but it's, it's happening. So um, are you guys excited to be at church today? Well, we have, um, it feels like this has been the year of big announcements and big things. Uh, those of you watching in Maui, we told our congregation here last January, guys, there's a big announcement coming in January. I don't know if you guys believed us, but we were like, no, it's happening. And then, bam, you guys in Maui, we, we partnered with you, a church there, and took you on as a campus. And there's been so many big things happening, but there's more big things happening. Uh, we have another big thing happening on September 22nd. It's all good. Don't worry. It's fun and exciting, but make sure. I'm asking people not to miss any week in this series, but if you have to, don't miss September 22nd. Everybody say, I promise. All right, that's all. So um, also, tomorrow is a very big day. Maybe not for you, but for me. Tomorrow is my anniversary. And uh, yeah, Mandy, yeah, Mandy and I have been married for eight years tomorrow. Can I embarrass you for a second? Please. Stand up real quick. This last week, I'm kind of nervous to do this, I wrote out the eight things I love most about you for eight years. Right now, I'm doing this right now. I'm nervous. I'm nervous. Okay, here they are. Here they are. <laughs> do you want to stand next? I'm a joke. Okay, so you can sit down if you want to. I don't care. Okay, number one, I love how much you love God. Number two, I love that you love me and believe in me um, and always have. I love how incredible of a mom you are to our kids. I love that you love the church and that we get to lead together. Number five, I love that you love people and you never give up on them. Number six, I love your audacious faith in God and boldness to really believe him. Number seven, I love that you're such a great leader and that you lead by example with integrity. And number eight, I love that you're my best friend. There's no one in the world I'd rather spend time with, hang out with, and travel with. I love you. Happy anniversary. <laughs> Hopefully we don't get divorced by tomorrow. I, I love you, Mandy. <laughs> eight years. Uh, eight years. So today, week one of our brand new series, Citizens of Heaven. I think this is very important because this series is a compounding series. So what you hear today is the first step of the vision. What you're gonna hear next week is the second step and so on and so on. Remembering that September 22nd, there's a very big special announcement and then on the week after that, on the 29th, we're going to be practically showing you through a message what we have been engaged with in our community and around the world and what we are currently engaged with that you may not know yet. So there are some very exciting things coming and with the title Citizens of Heaven, just to give you a brief history on why this, why this title, where did it come from? My dad mentioned a year and a half ago we were sitting in his office and we were talking about the vision of the church. He allowed me to start praying for the vision. After that 21 days of praying and fasting, I really felt like through a really uh, crazy cool series of events, um, two different pastors on the same day confirming in my heart what God was telling me, the exact same things, and I'll go into details of that story in a few weeks, I, I really felt like that was the beginning of, of a new mindset for me and how I view church, how we view the world, what is our role in this life, 
in this very temporary life that we're living. The Bible calls it but a vapor. In the middle of eternity, on both sides of this little sliver of time, we get to live in this world. Why are we here? What is our purpose? Is it to play church or is it to be the church? What are we supposed to be doing? How can we be the best stewards imaginable of the precious time we have in this world right now during your life? And over the last year and a half, I felt like God has really been just brewing this vision inside of me and Mandy and, and, and understanding what it means. But this was the scripture that came out of that 21 days of prayer and fasting that I felt like God was speaking to me and us that this would be the passage that really just encompasses our vision. It's Ephesians 2, 19 through 22. This is Paul writing to the church of Ephesus who were Gentiles. So then, you Gentiles are not foreigners or strangers any longer. You are now citizens together with God's people and members of the family of God. Together, we are his house, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets. And the cornerstone is Christ Jesus himself. We are carefully joined together in him, becoming a holy temple for the Lord. In union with him, you two are being built together with all the others... In a place, into a place where God lives through his spirit. So what Paul is telling the Gentiles in Ephesus is he's saying up until this point, the new Christians, the earliest Christians have been Jews. But you Gentiles are no longer foreigners on the outside looking in on this new movement, this, this new way, this new religion called Christianity. In Christ, you too can be called citizens of heaven. You are joining the family of God in Christ. And what Paul starts saying is we're all different bricks. We're all different pieces of this temple, this building, being joined together with all the diversity of the world. It doesn't matter what you look like, the, the color of your skin, the language that you speak, the culture that you reside in. In Christ, we are bricks being built together to build the house of God. And that's what I love about this Citizen of Heaven title. Yeah, it's exciting and it's so needed in our society right now. Our society is divided. I mean, we've, we've pushed people to the margins and, and we, look diff, we look down on some people because of their race or skin color and racism is still a problem. There's so many things happening and Jesus is saying, in my word, I have a solution. The solution is a unified church of Jesus Christ. Because we are all equal in the sight of God, and he loves us equally and uniquely, and in Christ, there are no foreigners, there are no outsiders, there are no strangers, there are only citizens of the kingdom of God. So that was just imprinted on my heart a year and a half ago. And so I started studying this citizen of heaven concept, this citizenship that we have in God. And it appears multiple times in the New Testament. And I had seen, I, I'd looked at these passages before. Do you ever look at something and then later on you come back and you go, I know I've looked at that, but I've never really seen it. You guys know what I'm talking about? That, that's what it was like for me um, when I would read scripture when this topic of citizenship in heaven would come out. It appears multiple times. One of the most famous times is Philippians um, chapter 3, verses 20 and 21. Again, it's Paul writing to the church of Philippi, and he says, We, however, are citizens of heaven. He's talking to the church. We, however, are citizens of heaven, and we eagerly wait for our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, to come from heaven. He will change our weak mortal bodies and make them like his, his own glorious body, using that power by which he is able to bring all things under his rule. So Paul's saying we're all citizens of heaven in Christ, and we're waiting on that day that Christ returns. One of the things I think a lot of churches have stopped talking about is the return of Christ. Guys, we have this hope to look forward to, not only the hope for us getting to heaven, but the hope that heaven is returning to earth through Jesus Christ when he comes back. And citizens of heaven can eagerly await that moment, and Paul's telling us that. He's saying this life, it's hard. There's pain, but we have a home, and it's not here. Hebrews 13, 14 says that exact thing, for this world is not our permanent home. We are looking forward to a home yet to come. I love that. I'm grateful that this world is not our permanent home. 
We have a home that's perfect, a home that is diverse yet unified. We have a home that all tears will be wiped away and pain will be gone because we're citizens of heaven. 1 Peter 2, 11 and 12 says, um, this is Peter writing, it says, I appeal to you, my friends, as strangers and refugees in this world. So now he's talking to Christians. He's talking to citizens of heaven. So think about the flip on this. I appeal to you, my friends, as strangers and refugees in this world. So what he's saying is, look, if you're a citizen of heaven, you're a stranger and refugee in this world. I want you to think about it, and I'll explain that. So yes, our home is there, but if our home is there, what does that make us here? Strangers and refugees in this world. Do not give in to bodily passions, which are always at war against the soul. Your conduct among those around you should be so good that when they accuse you of being evildoers, they will have to recognize your good deeds and so praise God on the day of his coming. I mean, Peter is saying something very, very, very like, wow, profound and almost outlandish. He's saying, hey, if you're a citizen of heaven, that means you're a stranger a foreigner, a refugee, in some translations say exile here. What does that refugee exile word mean? It comes from the Greek word peripitomus, and it actually literally translates into resident foreigner. Resident foreigner. So what Peter's saying here is, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, I want you to follow this. Yes, you're a citizen of heaven, And yes, we need to be proud of that, and we need to be excited about it. But what does that mean? If you're a citizen of heaven and your identity is there, it means your identity can't be here. It means you're a temporary resident foreigner. You live here, but you're not a citizen here. So I don't know if any of you have ever traveled abroad or been an exchange student, a foreign exchange student, or maybe some of you are from another country and you're not a citizen of the U.S. and you're here and you would actually even classify yourself as a resident foreigner, maybe a stranger to this land like Peter's talking about. And you might be fluent in the language here. You might really like your neighbors if you're not from here and you're not a citizen here. You might really like your neighbors. They might really like you. You might really have fun with them. You're even getting used to the green chili in Albuquerque, right? Like, you really like it, but at the same time, let's be honest, when you leave your group of friends and go back to your apartment or house, you're thinking a little bit, I like them, but they're still kind of weird. And the people you just left are thinking, man, I really like that person, but they're just different and kind of weird. Why? Why? And what Peter is saying here is so profound. It's so profound. He's saying the same way a resident foreigner feels a little bit weird in a, in a country that isn't their own. And even the people that are hosting the resident foreigner, they might think it's a little bit weird. Peter says, of all things and how I'm going to describe you Christians when you live in this world, that's the way I'm going to describe you. You should be living here, but you should be a little weird here. There might be, there needs to be some customs and some cultural aspects of your life, the way you speak, your taste in different things. You're, there might, there has to be that one thing or a few things. When you leave people, they go, I like them, but they're just kind of weird. And, and, I, and I don't, I can't really pinpoint it. And I'm going to hit on this stuff in a minute uh, in more detail at the end. But when we leave non-believers, from our workplace and our school, if we're a citizen of heaven and a resident foreigner here, every time we walk away from non-believers, they should be saying, I like them, but they're weird. I I can't get it. Why are they so generous? How can they forgive people like that? Why are they so happy? It's almost annoying. Like, I mean, almost those those types of things, right? And, And it all comes down to our identity. Where is your identity? And Peter and Paul in these different writings are saying the most dangerous thing that could ever happen for a citizen of heaven is to allow themselves to be a citizen of earth. Because if your identity is here, your life, I guarantee you, is shaking. You have anxiety. You have depression, maybe. Because all that matters is what you achieve here, how you feel here how people look at you here, the money that you have here. 
But those of us that are citizens of heaven say, yes, things affect me here because I'm a resident foreigner, but my hope and identity is in heaven, is in heaven. That's the difference. So we're temporary residents here. All through the Christian life, if you've been a Christian for longer than a minute, you realize that you still have pain, you still have tears, you still go through things, you still make mistakes, things still happen to you. Why? Because this is not our home. But one day when we are home, like I said earlier, all tears are gone. All pain is gone. All mistakes are gone because our home is in heaven. And I think one of Satan's greatest tactics in our lives is attacking our citizenship in heaven. I want you to think about this. Satan in every single... I was researching this week trying to think of any temptation I could possibly think of that Satan throws at us. Every temptation that he throws at you is all about and comes back to identity. He is trying to get you to have your identity anchored to this earth. He's trying to get your identity anchored in your job, anchored in your income, anchored even in your family, anchored in, a se- in sexuality, anchored in whatever it might be. Satan is desperately trying to tell you your identity is here. Compartmentalize God compartmentalize church. Yeah, there could be a heaven, but don't think about it. Be consumed by what you have here. This is all that matters. And if Satan can get you to believe that this is all that matters, you will be a wanderer and a stranger wandering in life, purposeless, without destiny, getting to the end of your life, looking back, going, what happened? What happened? It's that the enemy got you to believe this world is the most important thing, and it's just not. Where is your identity anchored? Is it in Christ as a citizen of heaven, or is it anchored in this earth which will perish and will one day be gone? So today, here's what I want to do. I want to go through two things so you can be grateful it's only two things instead of four. Two things today, two different aspects of being a citizen of of heaven and we'll go through these quickly the first thing i want to look at and again this is setting up the next three weeks after this the first aspect is i want to look at our rights as as citizens of heaven our rights as a citizen of heaven because when we have um, when we have citizenship anywhere whether it's this country or any country there are rights that come with that citizenship and who and what you belong to determines what rights and freedoms you have who and what you belong to. Um, We love, if you're an American, we love talking about American rights. Well, I have a right to do this, and I have a right to do that. And that's important, because all the people who have died in wars past, and all the military, they have fought for our freedom, they have fought for our rights, right? So we love having our rights, because it gives us identity, it gives us purpose, it gives us freedom. One of those rights that we have as an American citizen is travel and in citizenship in a lot of countries. But you get a passport. Anybody have a passport? When you have a passport, um, that document proves who you are. Isn't this kind of interesting to think about? You can't travel anywhere in the world without a passport. Have you ever like actually thought about that? You can't go anywhere in the world without proving who you are and whose you are. Who I am and whose I am. So what a passport does, first of all, when your identity is a part of a citizenship, it gives you access to things. But at the same time, a passport also proves who is behind you. I want you to think about this. Our rights, when we're talking about rights and privileges as a citizen of heaven, think about it as an American and how much greater it would be as a citizen of heaven. When we travel around the world, if you're an American citizen, and let's say you were abducted in another country, or let's say a a terrorist kidnapped you and you were taken hostage, or you were unjustly arrested and locked up. When that person takes out your passport out of your backpack and sees that you're an American citizen, they immediately know a couple things. They know who you are, but now they are scared because they know whose you are. Because that passport with your name on it, if you get unjustly arrested, 
If someone takes you hostage and they don't know that you're an American, the moment they find out, they know now the power of the entire U.S. military and all of its forces is behind this person because we don't leave people behind. We will do whatever we have to do diplomatically and even with force to bring those people home. And it should send a, a chill down people's spines when they find out who's behind us. I want you to think about that in the exact same way when it comes to our citizenship in heaven. Because every single day, we fight a spiritual attack in this world. We can't be in denial of it. We can't just because we don't like talk. We like talking about the good spiritual things, God and angels. Oh, I believe in God and angels. And then we say Satan and demons. People are like, can you believe this guy he actually believes in Satan and demons? I'm like, wait a minute. God and angels? We're like, yeah, that's great. Satan and demons? <laughs> uneducated guy up on the stage you know like isn't that weird we love the good spiritual but we're in denial of the bad spiritual and there is an evil and that evil the bible tells us comes to steal kill and destroy but when you are a citizen of heaven a citizen of heaven your identity says i belong to god not only who you are but whose you are when you know who you are and when you know whose you are you can look at the enemy and all kinds of spiritual attack that's happening to your mind your body you know when it's happening and you can stand firm and every demon in hell knows that when you say jesus they're not just messing with you they're messing with the legions of the armies of angels behind you and they have to flee they have to flee because we are citizens of heaven there's a perfect illustration of this in scripture and it's in acts chapter 22 starting in verse 25 this is paul and, and paul just got done with ministry to the gentiles in different areas in macedonia and and, and um, ephesus and philippi and he's made his way back to jerusalem remember jerusalem is is occupied by the romans and he's preaching and he's kind of found himself in trouble and arrested. And this is where we pick up in verse 25 of Acts 22. While the soldiers were tying Paul up to be beaten, he asked the officer standing there, is it legal to beat a Roman citizen before he has been tried in court? When the officer heard this, he went to the commander and said, what are you doing? This man is a Roman citizen. The commander went to Paul and asked, tell me, are you really a Roman citizen? Yes, Paul answered. The commander then said, well, I paid a lot of money to become a Roman citizen. But Paul replied, this is so profound, I was born a Roman citizen. The men who were about to beat and question Paul quickly backed off, and the commander himself was frightened when he realized that he had put a Roman citizen in chains. When we are under spiritual attack, and when the demons are whispering in your ear, and when Satan is saying, it's over, you're too far gone, your purpose is gone, your destiny is gone, no one church can actually make a difference. You're never going to become who you thought you were going to become. And when all of the spiritual forces are coming, when they're whispering in your ear, you say, you're not allowed to do this because I'm a born-again citizen. And in the exact same way, this happened in this story. I love the image. The officers and even the commander, the commander who commanded a legion, backed away from Paul in fear because they had just messed with a Roman citizen. Guys, I want you to get this. I've spent a few minutes on it because it's so profound. There is a spiritual attack, but we have to fight back. And how you fight back is declaring who you are and whose you are. I'm, I'm a son of the most high God. I'm a daughter of the most high God. I was born again. You can't hold my past over my head. It's been cleansed and gone because of the mercy and grace of Jesus. I am a son of the most high God. I'm a citizen of heaven. And when you say who and whose you are, the demons say, did you know that he was a citizen? Did you know that she was with Christ? And they begin to back off in fear because just the snap of God's fingers, they all tremble at his name. That's the power that we have behind us. Who are you? What's your identity today? Whose are you? Are you claiming something that you're not? Have you ever actually claimed, I am a born again believer in Jesus Christ? Today could be your day to step into being a citizen of heaven. Salvation through Jesus Christ. I love the image of God backing us up, backing us up. King David in Psalm 139 
says this, and, and, and I love it. I love his imagery and the way he writes. He says this in verse 5 of Psalm 139. You've gone into my future to prepare the way, and in kindness you follow behind me to spare me from the harm of my past. With your hand of love upon my life, you impart a blessing <clears throat> to me. I love this because as a citizen of heaven, <clears throat> God is in front of us, and God is behind you. He's covering your back, and he's blazing the trail, and his hand of blessing is upon his children. His children are those who have stepped into a life with Christ. His hand of blessing is upon you. The second aspect of citizenship that I want to look at today are the responsibilities as a citizen of heaven. Now, we could talk about the rights of a citizen of heaven. That could have been a whole sermon series on its own. All the benefits and the rights we have. It's amazing to see what we have access to in this life, even though it's temporary. But we also have responsibilities. Because where there are rights, there are responsibilities. Period. Um, my oldest son, Aiden, just started playing football this, this year, high school football. He's a freshman. And uh, my, my wife and I were at his orientation where a lady was talking about the expectations for the football team, a parent orientation. And she was saying, she was going through all these different things, and she said, hey, we're pretty hardcore about this. If you are going to represent this school, it's a privilege to be a part of this school, this dynasty of what we're working on with this football team. It's a privilege to put on the name of this school, the logo of this school. Therefore, you need to watch what you say on social media. There are certain things we will not allow on social media. You will be a great sportsman on the field and off the field. You will not trash talk other teams on the field and off the field. There is a code of conduct. There is a certain level of morality. And she was going at this pretty hardcore. And it was kind of like, all right, this is awesome. But what she was saying is, when you represent us, there are privileges to that. But at the same time, there are responsibilities that come with the name that you're claiming. And I, I love that because it's the exact same thing with Christianity. There are rights, but when you claim the name of Jesus, he doesn't demand perfection. You're going to mess up. You're going to make mistakes. But when you claim the name of Jesus, there are responsibilities you have to pick up. If you claim this name... There's a certain way of living, and we find that in Scripture, and I read it earlier, I'll read it again in this context. 1 Peter 2, 11 through 12 says, I appeal to you, my friends, as strangers and refugees in this world, he's talking to us, you're here temporarily, temporarily as strangers and refugees in this world, do not give in to bodily passions which are always at war against the soul. Your conduct, this is important, your conduct among those around you should be so good that when they accuse you of being evildoers, they will have to recognize your good deeds and so praise God on the day of his coming. A little bit of this seems, you know, kind of confusing if I'm honest with you. You know, even when they call you an evildoer, they're going to see good. What, what does that mean? That's that countercultural confusing, confusing thing I said at the beginning. Well, I like them, but they're kind of weird. They, 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 they disagree with me on this subject because the Bible says something, and I'm going to say they're evil because they believe in truth. They, they believe their truth should be on these people's truth, and they, whatever. And that's the kind of thing that people are saying in society right now. If we say there's such thing as truth, then we are oppressive. Uh, we, are, we are now evil because there's, there's a way, there's, there's a certain truth that God has in his word, right? So they'll say, hey, that's evil. But at the same time, why are they forgiving me? Why aren't they retaliating on social media? Why, why, why are they still being generous with me? As much as I don't like them because of what they believe, I, I, want, I want the marriage they have. And, and I, want, I want the relationship they have with their kids. And, and I, I want the community they have at, at their church. See, see that counter-cultural mindset? That it's just this it's tension this, that happens when we're in this world but not of it. And that's what he's saying. There's a certain way to live that just flips the world on its head and they don't know what to do with us. When you look at the first century church, that's basically just uh, the standard. You hear a lot of churches and even us talk about, man, when you see the first century church 
That's what we read about in the book of Acts and beyond. I mean, the explosion of the church, people getting saved and baptized and filled with the Spirit. I mean, this new thing called Christianity back then was called the way was exploding. It was different than every other religion. Every other religion said, do all of these things and eventually God will love you because you're earning his love. And then Christianity comes on the scene through Jesus saying, no, I did everything for you through my perfect life and dying on the cross. I took all the work. You just sit there and receive my grace in me. And Christianity started exploding. What do you mean I don't have to work? I don't have to earn God's love. I don't have to go through all of these different things in this religion and the eight levels of this and 10 levels of that. No, salvation is through Christ alone and what he did on the cross. And the first century church knew it and it started exploding. But here were some of the characteristics and traits. When Peter's talking about there's a certain way we need to live, there were four traits and characteristics of the early church that just flipped the world on its head. They didn't know what to do with it. The Roman Empire hated Christianity, but at the same time, Christianity loved the Roman Empire. They didn't know what to do with it, and it started exploding. The first characteristic they had and what we have need to have today and characteristics of what it means to be citizens of heaven, number one, radical forgiveness. Radical forgiveness. One of the worst traits a so-called Christian could ever have is unforgiveness. Unforgiveness. Guys, when we forgive the unforgivable, you are never more like Jesus. Jesus is going to the cross, dying at the hands of people who have beat him to the point of death, shoved thorns in his head, lashes on his back, nails through his hands, and he says, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. We are never more like Jesus when we can radically forgive. Some people say, well, I don't, I mean, are you talking about forgive the person who abused me? Yes, forgive that person. I'm not saying rekindle a relationship. Forgiveness is far more about you, between you and God than it is you and people. Forgiveness is letting go of you wanting to be God and letting go of it and putting it in God's hands, saying, God, you are the only righteous judge. I forgive. You are never more like Jesus when you forgive. And people in the early church were forgiving the Romans for killing them, for killing their family members. There are stories of mothers and fathers as someone's killing their child. The mom is crying and mourning for the loss of her child, saying, I forgive you. I forgive you. And their soldiers didn't know what to do. What are they supposed to do when someone's forgiving them as they're killing their child? The only thing they can do is have intrigue on this God that they're serving. It's like a magnet is being pulled and they're pulling toward the Holy Spirit who is calling them through radical forgiveness. The second trait that they showed back then of true citizens of heaven was sexual purity. Sexual purity. This is so controversial right now in our society. And even when I get up to preach sometimes and talk about it, I'm like, ugh. You know, it's just, it's so much stress because every word I say, I mean, one wrong slip and it's like, oh, this guy, you know, it's, it's insane. But let me tell you something. In a time when people don't know what identity is, when people have put identity into sex, we say, no, I'm putting my identity into Christ. Sex is something on earth, right? Christ is is eternal. My identity is in Christ. And sexual purity, what it looks like is what the Bible says. It's between a man and a woman. Sexual purity is sex outside of marriage is a sin. It's not an unforgivable sin, but it's a sin. Where we know that the target, the goal, the bullseye of every young person and adult who isn't married is to start new today and say, God, whatever has happened in my past, I I am asking forgiveness for it. Erase it, take it from me, and Jesus will say gladly. He'll take the weight off of you because that died with him on the cross. Then he says, today you're a brand new creation. What you do is you preserve your new, pure, purified self you preserve for marriage. You don't live together before marriage. You preserve your body 
for marriage. You get into marriage and you stay married to that person. And all of a sudden, when the early Christians were doing this and living this life, it was flipping the Roman culture upside down, which happens to be a mirror image of the culture we live in today. People were saying, wait, they're staying married for 40, 50, 60 years until death? But wait, wait, hold on, hold on. People were saying that they were like dying and, and they were married to the same person they were got married to in their 20s? I think it's great when we celebrate when people have been married for eight years. I think it's great when we celebrate that people have been married for 30, but when we lose our minds and go, they've been married for 20 years? I can't even believe this. Guys, we're losing. We're losing. And I know this isn't super fun to talk about, but I'm still gonna talk about it. And I, I, because I, I believe so whole, wholeheartedly that fulfillment comes. We are the creation. He's the creator. He said, I created you. I wrote the manual for your life. If you want fulfillment and purpose, you stay within the freedom that I gave you. And when you stay within that, you are free and you are no longer in bondage. So sexual purity, it, it just transformed people. They didn't know what to do about it. What do we do with these people? They're weird. They're like waiting to have sex. That's weird, right? But they didn't know what to do with it. And it attracted the culture. Number four, or I'm sorry, number three, unexplainable joy. Unexplainable joy, mainly in suffering, is what the, the, the writers were talking about. Unexplainable joy. That when people would pass away or when they were suffering, what this doesn't say is they're like laughing as they're dying. That's, that's not what this is saying. What this is saying is Christians mourn. We mourn. When you go to a Christian funeral, it's not that people are happy. They're mourning. That we, we are sad. But, I'm going to be honest with you, a Christian funeral is very different than a non-Christian funeral. Because we have a comma that I talked about a few weeks ago at the end of that funeral. We say, I mourn and my heart is broken. This is not what I wanted. We can even be frustrated with God and that's okay. Plenty of godly people in scripture were. But at the end of the day, we say, but my hope, my hope is in my citizenship in heaven that one day I will see this child again, this husband or wife again, this mother or father or grandparent again, because I have a hope and his name is Jesus. How do you have that hope? By becoming a citizen of heaven through Christ. And the world didn't know what to do with it back then and the world still doesn't know what to do with it today. How, how, how do you have joy after a child dies? Well, I wasn't happy. I'm sad every day. I cry every day. But I have this anchor in me that I can't explain. There's this anchor of hope and joy that I have and it came the moment I received Christ as my savior. It's my anchor that ties me to heaven knowing that this earth is temporary and will soon pass away. Unexplainable joy, number four, extreme generosity. Extreme generosity. I'm not even talking about money specifically at all. I'm talking about a life that looks like this instead of this. It's a life. Generosity, a life that is truly generous and open, that kind of person can't look down on people because of the color of their skin and because of the language they speak or the way they were brought up. A generous life says, I give. I give love. I give acceptance. I, I give money. I give time. I'm the one who stops. Look at the story of the Good Samaritan. I'm the one who stops when someone's hurt on the side of the road. I'm the one who stops when I hear that a family's going through something. I live an open life. I'm not looking down on anybody because it's only by the grace of God that I'm even standing. How can I look down on anybody because of what they've done? It's the same grace that saved both of us. When we are generous, we look at a city not as a problem, but as an opportunity. We, we look at a world not as a problem, but as an opportunity. It shifts. It shifts. Guys, I get frustrated with Albuquerque sometimes. There's sometimes I'm like, oh, why couldn't I have been born in Texas? You know, like that kind of thing. Like, it's perfect there, you know, whatever. But honestly, but this is the, I talk about this a lot. When we look at our city, Guys, there's a lot of bad statistics. If you're new to the city, just plug your ears real quick. There's a lot of bad statistics. But something changed in me a year and a half ago. 
I'm being super, if I can be super transparent, a year and a half ago, before this transformation in me, I would drive by homeless people and not get mad at them, but I would lump them into homelessness and be mad that our streets are dirty. Can I be that honest with you? I would look at the drug problem and look at drug addicts as the problem. Guys, here's the truth. We don't have a drug problem. We have an evil problem. We don't have a homelessness problem. There's an evil behind people that tears down their life and hope and they end up in situations that any of us could have ended up in and with just a couple different decisions we could have made. That's how you kind of just have this treading lightly feel instead of being harsh about what you see. You look at people and you go, that could have been me, but the grace of God, I'm not. That could have been me. That could be, that could be my daughter, my son. That could be my uncle. That, that guy, that man could have been my, my dad, but it's not. But he's somebody's dad. She's somebody's daughter. And we start looking at people like people and not as problems. We look at our city like an opportunity. That is a generous mindset. We look at it and say, no, I, I, I do believe one church can make a difference. I do believe that if we grasp this citizen of heaven concept where I know my identity is there in heaven, but while I'm here, I'm not going to put my anchor here into things that I can't take there. Because at the end of your life, you're not going to be counting your money and hoarding it and wanting to take it with you into death. You're going to look at this and go, God, did, did I do anything? Did I minimize Christianity to random church attendance? Or was I part of a movement? Was I part of a movement as citizens of heaven where we actually looked at cities and nations and said, could the church be the church? Could we actually do things, change things? Can I see people on the fringes of society and not look at them as problems, but say, what would Jesus think about that person and how can I bring them to the center because that's what Jesus wants to do spiritually for them? How do we have that mindset? If I'm being super honest with you, some of us need to even shift politically from the extremes and not let our identity be in a political party. Guys, if your identity is in a Republican or a Democrat, you're treading on dangerous dangerous ground because the kingdoms of men crumble and fall but the kingdom of God will last forever that's the truth that's the truth that's the truth I'm going to end there and I'm going to ask our worship team to come out and I'm going to ask people not to leave because we're about to sing one more worship song in a second we have a new album coming out um, in November I believe a worship album and the song we're about to sing, the song we're about to sing really encompasses the whole vision of who we are as a church. It's our anthem to God. And, and when we're done, I'm gonna come back and actually give people an opportunity to receive Christ. So if you can, unless it's an emergency, I'm gonna ask you to participate in this final song and even hang around when I come up afterwards and give you that opportunity to receive Christ today. If you guys would go ahead and stand, let's sing this anthem loud and proud to God because we are citizens of heaven.